to the podium, Mr. Jarek Robbins. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of JRC TV. We have a very special guest. He should be right up there in the video. Good morning, Scott. How are you? Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me on here. Very welcome, and hopefully very welcome from everyone else, too. Uh, I'm very excited for this guest. He has a brand new book called Find the Fire, Ignite your inspiration, and make work exciting again. Now, the reason I love this, not only is it endorsed, I think, by Marshall Goldsmith, who's amazing, Brian Tracy, one of our friends there, Seth Godin. All these people are saying great things about the book, which is awesome. I'm excited to share with you some of the content because it takes a new perspective on, on things that are talked about you know, b between different development groups and personal development and growth and all these things. And, and it gives you a new spin and a new point of perspective, which I love and I can't wait to share with you. Now, to give Scott a fair introduction, let me come over to the bio section here. And if you don't mind, I'll read a little bit about you to everyone here. Sure. Scott is a best-selling author of Make It Matter, How Managers Can Motivate by Creating Meaning a book that received many accolades, including the 2016 Leadership Book of the Year. He was the f and, and first runner-up uh, by Leadership and Management Books, which is awesome. Um, he's a Procter & Gamble veteran who ran several of the company's largest multi-billion dollar businesses, consistently transforming business results and organizational cultural health scores along with it, which is awesome. An award-winning keynote speaker and CEO of Profound Performance, a keynote workshop coaching and online training company to help you work, lead, and live fulfilled. I love it. Um, so much in alignment here. He's been named CEO Thought Leader by the CEO Executive Guild and Top 50 Leadership Innovators by Inc., um, where he writes a bi-weekly column on the national publication on his topics of experience, employment management, Others oriented leadership, meaning in and meaning in and at work, workplace culture, and how to motivate, inspire, success in entrepreneurship. Whew. Wow. So <laughs> well said. obviously he's up to a lot of amazing things in the world. And Scott, thank you for taking time to jump on here and, and share a little life and love with our audience. We really appreciate it in advance. Fantastic. Glad glad to be here. Um, and, and so let's dive in. If we can start on the simple question, what was the inspiration beyond behind uh, find find the fire? Ah, super question, and uh, maybe a little bit of a, a combination of complex and easy answer. I, I would say um, first and foremost, it was just the accumulation of having been in uh, corporate life for gosh almost three decades. When push comes to shove, right. you know, really. Oh, yeah, geez, almost three decades. And just experiencing firsthand what happens to individuals in their attempt to climb uh, the, the corporate ladder. I'm sure you can uh, you can appreciate this and your followers can appreciate this. But, you know, it, it turns out that 70 percent of us is really, as I like to say, have lost that loving feeling at work and feel, you know, feel uninspired when all is said and done as we try to, to climb the corporate ladder. And I experienced that firsthand running massive businesses um, at, at P&G and becoming a bit of a research nerd in the space of what motivates human beings and inspires human beings. And I knew that there had to be a way that I could help because uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to create the kind of, um, I guess, organizations, I would say, Jarek, that, that really were excited to come to work in the morning. Hmm. And I knew I was onto something. And people started asking me to come and talk about uh, the cultures I was creating that people were lining up around the corner to come in and work for. And I started researching it almost 20 years ago and, and found that, holy moly, there's a whole lot of people out there who have lost a spark and have lost a fire. And I have got to find a way to help these people bring happiness and joy and excitement back into their work life because we only get one shot at this. And we spend way too many of our hours at work. So that was the both complex and simple inspiration. I, I felt that I just I was called to be able to provide help for people like that that were experiencing that. That's wonderful. And so it, it obviously leaves a big question. 
what were some of the secrets to actually creating an organization of people who loved to come to work? And, and it, it's such a big thing because, you know, I was reading research that shows when people are happy and, and this is part of loving your work when you're happy, um, you, you, you take less sick days, you perform better, you do more sales. Like there's so many benefits to people actually enjoying the process every day. Um, and not only that, they have better marriages, better friendships, better community involvement. They generally make more money. Like all these amazing benefits show up when someone actually enjoys what they're doing. So what, what's some of the secrets there? And, and in the book, I, I was reading the chapter titles in a little, um, I, I think you threw out a teaser in one of your emails. I was reading the little paragraphs of description of each chapter. And one thing that's interesting, instead of just taking it from the angle of, well, think positive and work hard and you know, do these things, which you see so often, um, it, it, it's saying, hey, why don't we get rid of the things that are actually preventing you from enjoying this? And, and, and so I, I'd love to know, two-part question. One, what are some of the things that were necessary to really help these people enjoy it? And then two, l maybe we can dive into a few of the things people need to get rid of to actually be able to enjoy it more in their own life if they're listening in. Yeah, well, great question, um, Jerry. And I'll, I'll answer that. I'll do a little bit of a, a brief setup, which will also help explain the premise of the book, uh, Find the Fire. And then I'll get right to your question of like, so what do people do to overcome the malaise? But well, one of my favorite statistics to cite, uh, something that just blew me away when I came across this, because uh, like I said, I'm a huge research nerd. I'm connected to uh, research universities all over the world in the, in the topic of motivation and inspiration. And one of the single most stats that blew me away the most was research shows that the vast majority of employees, really almost 60%, will say when they're polled, look, the number one thing that's most important, if I'm going to be, you know, if I'm going to have a leader that I, I believe in, is that leader has to be inspiring. Hmm. And yet, almost less than 10% will say, my actually, my current boss is inspiring. Hmm. So the first problem is, is, if you're waiting around for your boss, which is where it begins and it ends for many people, on whether or not they're going to feel excited, inspired about their work, you're going to be waiting a long time because it, it ain't going to, it ain't going to happen. And a lot of people will say, but you know, but what am I supposed to do, like? How do I self-inspire? It's so mysterious. It's so elusive. Mm -hmm. And what the book talks about is that, in fact, inspiration can be codified and coaxed. And this will start to get to um, your, your question directly now. It turns out you really can create the conditions where inspiration is much more likely to occur. And to set this up, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a background. Greek mythology wants to find inspiration in a, a number of different ways, but the original definition of it was that Zeus and Cyanime had nine daughters, and uh, these nine daughters were goddesses known as the, the Muses. They were, Greek mythology says that they were around to whisper in the ears of artists, and you may have heard before the term of, you know, I'm waiting for my muse to inspire me. Hmm. Well, what if it turned out in the real world that there were actually anti-muses? Nine forces that sucked the life out of us. It sucked the, the inspiration out of us at work. And the premise of my book is that there in fact really are. And that when you're feeling uninspired and, and, you're tr and you're trying to rekindle that spark, the wrong question is to ask, well, what inspires me? And then try to go do more of that because there's, there's real problems with that. That approach is passive and elusive and it's often repressed within an organization. The better question to ask is, how did I lose my inspiration in the first place? Mm. Because when you started your job, there's a darn good chance that you didn't have to work very hard at it. Inspiration was everywhere. You were just completely overjoyed to be there and you drew inspiration from everything. And when you ask yourself, how did I lose my inspiration in the first place? With help from my book, the nine anti-muses start to emerge. The causes now, directly to your question now, Jerk, the causes of what sucks the inspiration out of us and what we have to do. So I'll quick touch on each of the anti-muses. There's nine of them. The first um, is, is probably the most painful, fear. It is such a devastating force. Fear disrupts the preparedness of our mind for being inspired and engages our brain in the wrong conversation. Whether it's fear of failure, fear of change, fear of criticism, it can draw the life out of us. And in the book, I talk about how to overcome each of those. Hmm. Uh, the next thing I'm using is settling and boredom, how we can become just 
over time we realize we stop learning, we stop growing, we fall into a routine of tasks one after the other without stopping to realize I've got to break out of this cycle. Uh, I'm becoming, I've settled. And, and what I've settled for is unacceptable. If I were to step back and look at it, we stop seeking opportunities. We stop taking risks. I talk in the book of how to overcome all of that. Hmm. The next anti-muse or the force in, in which drains our inspiration is inundation. And I often like to say that being overwhelmingly busy is the new black, right? Everybody, it's like a status symbol of <laughs> how busy I am. But the truth is it's having a tremendous impact on our levels of inspiration at work. And that's not just me or my experience. Research is very clear on that. I, so I'll, we can I'll throw some. Yeah. I'll throw something in there that's very interesting. Yeah. My, my wife used to work at, at a digital ad agency, and she was in charge of a you know multi four point two million dollar ad budget for McAfee and all this other stuff online. And what was wild is when we first started working together, and she came out of corporate over into you know uh, entrepreneurship, or, or you know we own our own business and, and we have our own small team, and so we're working together in, in, a, in a small business. One thing that was very interesting is we started interviewing other couples that work together as entrepreneurs. And what we learned was from another lady who did the same thing, came out of corporate into a small business. And what she found out was she didn't realize how she judged how, quote unquote, successful she was, was based on how busy she was every day. It wasn't based on outcomes or results or accomplishments or tasks completed or goals met. It was based on how busy she could be. And so what was interesting is she gave us that clue for the people who transitioned from corporate over to small business. She said, hey, you need to reset the way you look at it so that it's no longer about what you said here, inundation. It's no longer about how busy you can be. It's about how productive you can be, how, how many things you can actually accomplish, how many tasks you completed, how much progress you can make. And, and she said it, it took her a solid probably four to six months, she said, to reset her brain that it's not about just trying to show people how busy she is every day and how many meetings she had and how many people she called and this kind of stuff. So her and her husband had an interesting time resetting that, they said, in, in their uh, financial management practice because – he'd come to the end of the day and say, well, what did you accomplish? And she said, well, I made all these calls and sent all these emails and talked to all these people. I was busy all day. And, and he's like, but what was accomplished? And and she'd be like, well, I did it all. And and he'd scratch his head and be like, but that doesn't cause the business to grow. <laughs> So, so just to parlay it for any you know entrepreneurs listening, um, this is something you might want to make sure you're paying attention to definitely, and 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 reset from that perspective. And, and for people you know who are still in the corporate world, this is really important. Um, but but back to the nine, I think that was our third one. Yeah, no worries. I, I did want to say you're exactly right, Jared. By the way, uh, uh, social science research also teaches us that one of the biggest mistakes leaders can make is when they evaluate and reward someone based on the activity and the activity systems rather than the actual outcomes. Mm. So we create, you know, we, many of us work in a culture that feeds that exact problem. And, you know, the, the other thing about inundation is there's these natural forces working against us that we feed into that continues our sense of feeling overwhelmed when, when we don't make choices and set priorities, when we continually procrastinate, mm. when we're perfectionists, when we, we don't know how to master the art of truly pushing back and, and doing it in a way that you could still look good. Right. Uh, when, we, when we're not present, when you're there but you're not you know, um, really there, when, when you try to ask for help and, and, and you want to look good in doing that but you're afraid to ask for help, mm. all of that weighs into our inability to get out of this muck and this mire of inundation. And I talk a lot about that in, in the book about how to overcome that. Nice. Um, and of course, stop me anytime you want. I'll, I'll keep going through the anti muses. Again, these are the forces that suck the inspiration out of us. The fourth one is uh, just a sense of loss of control. Mm. And I don't know if you've ever felt this. Um, having been in a corporate world and I enjoyed, you know, Jerk, every, probably every moment of it, there were times, though, when you just felt like, I am giving away my power in some way. I feel less and less in control of my life and my work. How do I take it back and how can I em emit power? And that's another one of the anti-muses is, is being able to fight this loss of control we feel. Hmm. Another one is a dwindling self-belief. And I can't tell you how many people I interviewed for this book that 
you know, with open hearts poured out to me that their company was draining the extra out of extraordinary. And they were making the ordinary, the extraordinary, sorry, feel uh, ordinary. Mm. And how their confidence can, was continually dwindling and it was draining on their sense of inspiration at work. And so I talk in the book on how to combat this anti-muse by countering and, and building your self-confidence, persevering in the, in the face of challenges. And again, how to be mindfully present and how to earn respect, how to really earn it in a way that it's genuine and that it sticks and that it builds your belief in yourself once again, because it can quickly start to spiral down once we start to doubt ourselves and we feel inspiration exiting out the door. Mm. Let's take a moment on that. What, yeah. what, what's a tip or two on how to earn respect? It, it, oh. it, it, it's, it's interesting. Interesting topic. Yeah. It's, have, have you felt this before, uh, Jerick? Have you ever been in a situation where you didn't feel respected? I'll set it up and then I'll give you a couple of tips. Sure. Um, let me think back. So I... I it's interesting. I worked for a family member um, when I first started, and and when we were starting to work together, there was a very interesting conversation, and and he said he he was kind of training me, educating me, and, and preparing me the best of his ability, and and he said, you know, you know, I will always love you, but respect is earned. <laughs> and I remember yes. going, oh, interesting. <laughs> And, and so that, that's part of what caught my thing with earning respect is, is it, it was an important lesson I was taught very young of like, hey, you got to earn it. It's not something that's given to you. You don't just, it's not automatic. It, it's something that people can still love you or care about you as a good person. But in order to earn their respect, there's certain things you have to do. And so I was taught that from a young place. And in the beginning, um, I earned uh, disrespect is the wrong word. They weren't disrespecting me whatsoever, but because I came in with a very interesting attitude, and, and let me give you a specific scenario. I was offered the, the ability to go get a specific job, which is an outside office-to-office -office sales job. Now, for this job, there's only 10 people ever picked, and you have to memorize a 36-page script of the presentation, and you got to know it word for word. Oh my God. And so it, it, it's like an audition for a movie. Like you got to, and you got to be able to act out the script too and animate it and make it fun, entertaining because you're out presenting to, you know, thousands of people a month on behalf of the company. And, and so it's an interesting job and people fight over this job in that company. So I, I, I went for it and I got the script. I flipped through it and, and I did something that young people do, which is, yeah, I got, I got the gist of it. I, I, I understand the point. I, I get what they're doing here. I got it. And I did not memorize it word for word. And so what happened was I went in for the audition. They brought in the whole room of salespeople. I stood up in front of the room and said, hi, welcome to the presentation. And within about three minutes, the boss stood up and said, okay, stop there. And he said, everyone else, you can leave. And he <laughs> sat down with me, looked me straight in the face, and he goes, listen, I'm going to be real straight with you. You're going to get one more shot at this. And if you don't memorize the script, you'll never get a shot at this again in your life, and I'll make sure of it. And I was like, wow, what a mean fella. And those weren't the words I used, but I'll use those for now. And, and there was this feeling of, wow, he doesn't respect my effort. He doesn't respect my whatever. And, and it, it, it's an attitude being young that we think, or I thought, well, hey, I gave it a good shot. Aren't I supposed to get a high five? Or like, hey, here's what you could do better, fella. And, and you learn quickly in, in the business world, like, no, you don't get a high five for trying. Like, <laughs> you got to perform. Respect is earned. I was like, oh, shoot. So I spent the next 30 days memorizing that script word for word, came back, and I, I got it to a point where, you know, I could say it with my eyes closed half asleep at two in the morning if you woke me up and start from anywhere. Like, I knew this thing, and it's probably still in me to this day, seven years later. But that, like, I really got it, and I went back, nailed it. And it was a whole different experience with that, that boss standing up and shaking my hand and saying, hey, welcome to the team. That was impressive. And it's like, wow, the ability to earn that ex respect and to experience the respect was whole different than not having it on the front end. That's such a good, great story. Such a good setup, uh, Jerry, for, a, for a, a framework that I've developed and been testing and using for over two decades now wow. that I'd love to share with uh, you and your listeners and your viewers. Um, and it works like this. So one of the interesting things about your story is where, where people make a mistake in earning respect 
is they'll begin to chase a random set of behaviors that they believe will earn the respect from their from the intended person that they want to earn respect from. Hmm. And man, that's start that's a fool's game. When you start chasing a random set of behaviors and in, in hopes of, of mac- maximizing respectability, all that happens is you end up losing yourself. You end up losing your authenticity. Wow. So there's a much more powerful framework that's populated from social science research that identifies what are the most universally known, I guess, uh, characteristics and behaviors that are most universally respected by individuals. And you can think about it in a framework in three ways, three key questions. What can you give to earn respect? What should you resist to earn respect? Hmm. And what should you exude to earn respect? And I'll Hmm. give you a couple examples in each. What should you give to earn respect? Well, Social science research tells us that when you give more than you get, when you give your time and your knowledge, Mm. when you give away praise and credit, Mm. when you give the extra 10% every time, when you give your point of view and stick by it, when you give your feedback and you're blunt but compassionate about it, and when you give your word and keep it, and when you give respect, you'll get it back in return. Those are the things that we need to give to earn respect back. Now, what about resist? Research tells us these are the things that can cause you to lose respect so quickly. You need to resist taking credit. You need to resist workplace gossip and sharing secrets. Mm. You need to resist, and this is one I had to work on, Jerry. I mean, big time. You need to resist over-apologizing. You need to resist feeding into negativity and negative Nellies. And you need to resist blaming. Hmm. Those are kind of the big, uh, the big six, if you will, of what you need to resist. And then finally, what can you exude? So we talked about what you give, what you resist. Now, what do you exude to earn respect? And the research tells us there's a couple of things. Those that tend to exude professionalism, hmm. accountability, transparency, hmm. confidence. I'll give you just a few more a sense of compassion as well as collaboration and what um, I call the class act vibe, Hmm. which is the the intersection of giving respect, always having integrity and um, and showing humility. And so when, when you have a simple framework and you stop chasing everything and you just keep reminding yourself what you want to give, resist and exude to earn respect, believe me, This framework has helped thousands of people, and I think it can help your viewers and listeners as well. I love that. What to give, what to resist, and what to exude. That's powerful. That's powerful. I really love that. Easy to remember, right? It is. Let's see. So we're at one, two, three, four, five. We're at five out of nine. I'm curious what these other four are. Okay, yeah. So the next uh, anti-muse... Uh, and again, these are the forces that suck the inspiration us out of out of work, and and you can you can create the conditions to fight those. The next one is a sense of disconnectedness, hmm. where we're at work, but we don't feel like we're linking with our friends and people around us anymore. Uh, maybe we get moved into a new team, and um, I could do a whole podcast on the, you know what happens when we're introduced as human beings to a new team. The what happens just socially and psychologically to us but when we feel disconnected because we're we're no we don't no longer feel camaraderie uh, with mm. our brethren um, when we we've lost the ability to engage in healthy debate mm. with our team and you know what's so interesting is people often don't think about this but the beginning of what disconnects us from our coworkers is when we start to lose the ability to debate in a healthy way and we start to take um, arguments personally. We start Ooh. to read into arguments. And it begins a very slippery slope where a coworker all of a sudden ends up on your naughty list yeah. or someone that you don't want to connect with. And uh, you become disconnected and you don't even realize it's happening to you. So you can, there are ways you can cultivate healthy debate. Um, and then, you know what? Probably the biggest one of all is just tough coworkers, man. It can make us feel so disconnected when you go into work and you have that. One person on a team of 10, I'm making this up, and you guys just don't see eye to eye, Mm. and they suck the life out of you, and they're so hard to work with, 
and finding ways to bridge that gap and build a relationship with even the toughest of coworkers helps us feel connected again with the, the social aspect of our job and can bring inspiration back in life. So that's the, that's the sixth anti-muse. Um, the seventh is, um, and this is one of the most emotional ones uh, that I uncovered in my research, which was a dearth of creating. In other words, people telling me that they looked up and they realized in their jobs, my God, I stopped creating. I stopped building. I stopped producing meaningful output. I'm no longer doing my best work. I'm just going through the motions and I'm spending an awful lot of time on things that don't matter. Research tells us, uh, and I confirmed this myself in a survey of over 2,000 mid-level workers across the United States, that over 40% of workers in the United States today would say that, get ready for this one, up to 50% of the work on their work plan is not adding any value that they can see. Wow. So there's this incredible swath of work being done that's making no difference, and it's getting in the way of people bringing their unique creations to, to mind and to, into the planet that gives us an incredible sense of inspiration. Talk to any artist, and they'll tell you that half of why they do it is this burning need to create. Mm. Um, so that's a, that's a really powerful one. Um, there's uh, two more to cover. By all means, interrupt whenever. The yeah. next uh, anti-muse is a sense of insignificance, mm. where you just look up and you realize, you know what? Somehow, I'm not really sure I matter that much at work anymore. I don't know what happened, but I look back and I don't really think I'm making that much of a difference anymore. And that is, you know, I talk an awful lot about significance in my first book, Make It Matter, and how you can create meaning in the place of work. And it holds true for the individual employee trying to re-inspire themselves. When you feel like you're insignificant, that you can be replaced and the place wouldn't skip a beat, that there and that is very difficult to recover from. There are things you can do though that I talk about in the in the book to bring back your sense of significance. Mm. Things you can pursue to re relight the the feeling that you actually do matter at work. What are a couple of those? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to share a few. And and uh, some of these are so emotional. It was so interesting, Jerry, because I was getting stories um, around this particular anti muse. I would say more than any other. Uh, inter interviewers were in tears telling me that they had not done any of these things in their career in a long time. Hmm. So I'll give you a couple of examples of, of ways you can help solve a circumstance, hmm. seek out a situation. And if, and if you've ever been uh, in a pickle and you had someone help you out, you never forget that. Yep. You simply never forget that. So taking a mindset of, of seeking out, um, of circumstances you can help solve gives us a sense of sig significance mm. as does being the champion for change that's sorely needed it's one thing to talk about the system and how the system is broken it's one thing to work in the system it's another thing to work on the system and when you work on the system versus just in the system you're changing the way you engage with your job every day and you change the relationship with your job and it brings a tremendous amount of significance mm. you can lead what only you can lead and the truth is we all have superpowers, right, Jerick? I mean, we all know them. If I were to ask your viewers, everybody right now, pull out a pencil and tell me a couple of your most deeply held superpowers, things that you know you're good at. And no matter what anybody said, if they were trying to criticize you, they couldn't make you think differently. You are good at them. Those superpowers can help you understand, all right, I can use those for good rather than evil. What can I lead that simply no one else could lead? That brings a tremendous sense of significance. And you can apply that to filling an unmet need or doing a deed that simply needs to be done that isn't ha been done uh, at work yet. You can redefine the category you compete in to completely reframe the business that you work in. I'll give you a very simple example. In my days in uh, uh, Procter & Gamble, um, there was, you know, once upon a time where uh, Febreze, the, the spray, was simply a, a little, some liquid that you spray to take care of, you know, like uh, cigarette smoke and um, to make clothes feel better. They completely repositioned the category and said they're in, you know, kind of air quality and air care and expanded the number of products. Tide decided, uh, Tide detergent decided they weren't just laundry detergent, they were clothing care. And they completely reframed the category and opened up an incredible amount of opportunity. And the people behind that shift in category thinking uh, 
look back and tell me it's one of the most significant things they were ever part of in their in their career. Wow. You can do small things too, Jared. You can just simply help move someone forward in their career. That's within all of us to do that. You can help a coworker. You can help a peer. You can help a boss. Look for ways to help them move forward, either on a project or uh, or on a uh, you know uh, in their career, uh, whatever. And these are just a few of the ways that you can self-inspire by looking for ways to add significance back at work again. Is this is this making sense? Yeah, that's wonderful, wonderful. I love that redefining the 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 way you do business or what it is that you do to the marketplace, fulfilling a need. Um, you know, leading what only you can lead. That's awesome. Uh, helping others move forward. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that one. There, there's something, you know, uh, there's a, a phrase that always catches my attention that I'm a huge believer in, which is life supports that which supports life. <laughs> and and there's something special about that where uh, so many people have had this experience where you, you dedicate yourself towards a cause bigger than you, whether it's helping, you know, build a school or helping someone else, you know, making a career advancement. And what's interesting is you might not know how to do it, you might not know how it's going to work out or what's involved or how in the heck you're going to pull the resources together. But the moment you make the decision to commit to helping someone else, it's amazing how many pieces naturally fall into place to support you in supporting them. It's really wild, yes. really wild. And, and, and I, I just you know picked up that belief a long time ago, which is life supports that which supports life. And so that ability to feel significant by helping others move forward with their career it literally, you'll, you'll tap into, I don't know if it's magic energy of the universe or some unwritten law, but there's something there that will naturally support you in the process and help you make that assistance to others happen. And, and all you have to do is commit to it, and, and, and that's where the magic starts to unfold. It's very interesting. I love that one. Very well said. You know, the universe opens up to, to good people. And for those of us that, you know, my... People often ask me, you know, like you, uh, Jerick, you know, I'm a speaker, I'm an author, I'm a writer, um, and the centerpiece of my entire business model is simply this burning passion to help others become the best version of themselves. Mm. And if we just try to do a little bit of that each each and every day, I can assure you a sense of significance will eke back into your work day. Uh, the, the power of focusing on others in addition to what we need in life is undeniable, as you have said. It's amazing. Uh, to round out, so the very last anti-muse, just to round out uh, your question, it's been quite a journey here. It's um, what I call the lack of evocation. Hmm. And what I mean by that is inspiration can come from within, and we've talked a lot of ways to do that. Inspiration also can come when we're inspired by something, hmm. a beautiful painting, a boss, uh, a, a, a compelling idea. And what happens if you're working in an environment where there's a lack of evocation? Nothing evokes your inspiration. Uh, maybe the place you're working in, you know, is a dump. Maybe the culture is toxic at best. Maybe the managers that you work for, and this is a big one, are like almost impossible to get along with. And you can't see yourself being inspired in your job because of that toxic boss. This is what this and I muse takes away the ability for us to be inspired by something. And in the book, Find the Fire, I talk about um, how you can um, kind of change the conditions and turn it on their head, You ways you can behave to evoke better behaviors, how you can change your relationship with that incredibly difficult boss, believe it or not, to turn it into a more inspirational relationship than it currently is uh, right now. So those are uh, the nine anti-muses um, backed by almost two over two decades of research and and I'm just so excited to be able to share those uh, with your viewers because uh, the book describes in, uh, inspiration, the science of it in detail. It describes these anti-muses and, and how that happens to us. And it describes how to overcome each and every one of them so that your viewers and listeners can reignite their spark and, and reignite their passion for work. That's phenomenal. And, and this book is coming out in hardcover. I think it says October 12th is the release day. That, that is correct. Yep. Um, you can order it now on okay. uh, scottmoutz.com, uh, S-C-O-T-T-M-A-U-T-Z.com. You can order it now, and it'll be uh, shipped shortly thereafter. Um, but yeah, it officially releases October 12th. 
Very cool. So what we'll do is we'll put the link uh, below this video if you're on YouTube, below the audio if you're on iTunes. If you're in our blog, you obviously have already seen the link all over the place. So make sure to click that link um, and, and, and go grab a couple copies. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab some myself and send them to friends. And, and I'm, I'm excited. I've only gotten to read the, the, the teaser paragraphs you shared with me. So I'm, I'm excited to grab a copy myself as well and uh, read through all the rest of it. This is so interesting. So just to recap, it, it's the nine anti-muses. Fear, uh, settling in boredom, inundation, loss of control, dwindling self-belief. Did I get that yeah. right? Yep, dwindling self-belief. Dwindling right? self-belief. Disconnectedness. Uh, dearth of creativity, insignificance, or lack of evocation. And, and, and what's wild in these nine things, I'm very excited. Thank you for going deep on a few of them for us. Um, but it, uh, being in a, in a similar industry, I meet so many people who are s settling and, and, and struggling with these things. That's why I was so excited to be able to share this message with our community. Hopefully, it'll ripple out around the world. I know we have people who watch this everywhere from... Uh, here in the U.S. to Central and South America, we have, we have a, a large group over in Dubai and, and Abu Dhabi and places like that, all corporate who, who watch. So hopefully they'll they'll take note of this in Tokyo as well, and they'll they'll see it. And ideally, these are not only things to read about and getting a copy of the book, but in in my perception and understanding and how you're sharing it, it would make sense for them also to probably give you a call and bring you out to come and discuss this with their organization. Um, just because, like you said, if you can help them, I know there's a big happiness initiative going on in the uh, United Arab, Arab Emirates right now where they're focusing on how do you bring happiness into their organizations, and, and it's becoming a country initiative. Um, the gentleman in charge of the whole country has made it the initiative to focus on. So, so it's very interesting. Something like this can literally bring back the satisfaction at work, the happiness at work, the, the ability to really truly enjoy what it is you do every day. And for those of you who are watching who are in entrepreneurship category, make sure you make all these things not happen in your company. <laughs> <laughs> if you're if you're the boss, you know, <laughs> go to Scott's website, um, and, and we'll make sure the links here. But go to Scott's website, learn these things, read this book, and make sure. Hey, how do I make sure my team isn't struggling with any of these things? Like, be the inspiring boss. Um, might be a next book you write, but <laughs> yeah, that's right. The, the the concept of be the inspiring boss. You know, make sure you talk about the fears with your team and, and use the tactics in the book to help them sort through those things. Uh, if you see someone who looks and, and maybe feels like they're out of control, use the tactics in the book to help them regain control. So it's kind of also a great manual for someone who's in charge of their team to use it to learn how to make sure their team doesn't struggle with any of these nine things. And they're constantly making an environment that will help them overcome these things. Yeah, Re really well said. And, you know, I guess my my last message, my last plea to your viewers and your listeners, Jarek, is just to remember that you don't have to sit silently and suffer mm. in your job. You don't have to do it. You you absolutely can reignite the sense of inspiration at work. It's not a mysterious thing that ebbs and flows based on luck. Inspiration can be codified. It can be coaxed. You can create the conditions where inspiration is much more likely to occur. I have almost two decades of science behind this mm. and over two decades of experience in creating cultures where these things have, uh, th that I'm putting into play, they really do work. And uh, people don't have to sit and suffer anymore and just assume, well, work is work. I'm going to get what I'm going to get out of it. You don't have to think about it that, that, that way anymore. You can find the fire. I love it. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, for everyone listening one more time, www.scottmautz.com. Go grab a couple copies of this book, read one yourself, pass it on to your favorite friend or coworker, and let them help find the fire along with you. Uh, Scott, thank you again for joining us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for taking time to tune in, watching, listening, or reviewing this in some way, shape, or form. We appreciate you. And I will see everyone out there next week for another episode of JRC TV. Till then, have an amazing week, everyone. Thanks, Scott. Thanks so much. Take care.